Good morning and good afternoon or evening, depending on where you are in the world. And welcome to DCD Towards Net Zero, the global summit on data center sustainability. This conference looks at where the data center fit into a zero carbon future. And we're going to be looking at the CSR challenges the industry faces, the renewable energy alternatives, sustainable supply chains, carbon accounting, and the latest technologies and policy developments as the industry strives to find its place in a more circular economy. This is part of DCD's always on content program for the data center cloud and edge infrastructure industry. We've pulled together a powerful lineup, as you can see on this slide, of industry experts to share their insights on this topic. And I'd like to thank them all for their very valuable contributions. Now, on this very colorful slide, uh, you'll see there's a glimpse here of our spring and summer virtual conference schedule, where we'll be looking in depth at data center operations, edge compute, grid scale energy, data center design and construction, and so much more. Full details of our 2021 calendar are available at datacenterdynamics.com, where you can register for each of those conferences now. And I'd also like to add that entries for DCD's Global Awards have just opened. So please take a look at the categories in the awards website link in the resource box on your screen and start planning your entry now. Best of all, everything we do is recorded apart from the roundtables, so you don't have to miss a thing. You can watch all of our conference programming whenever and wherever you like. So just look for the On Demand tab on our website's top navigation bar. Before I introduce the next session, let me tell you about some of the functionality that we've built into the virtual conference experience. We have a Q&A widget on the screen in front of you that you can use live. And us as the moderators will try to include your questions in the speaker Q&A section. And if we don't have time to cover your question, it will be forwarded to the speaker or speakers. In the resources widget, you'll find very useful downloads and links relevant to the session. And you can also find the full conference agenda here too. On the screen, you'll find a link through to DCD Connect platform, where you can network with speakers, delegates, and our sponsors. And do make use of the one-to-one -one meeting widget to set up meetings with INEO and Clark Energy, who are our speakers today. I'd also like to invite you to take our five-minute survey. We're going to be donating $10 to the Chain of Hope charity for every survey taken. So it is a very good cause. You can access this via a widget in the resource box. And last but not least, many of our sessions have roundtables to allow us to continue the conversation, including this one. And you'll find details on how to join on screen and in the agenda. Now, thank you for sticking with me. I've got through all of the housekeeping notes. I'd like to introduce our next two speakers to the virtual stage. First, I'd like to introduce Adam Ray Summerson, a product development manager at Clark Energy. Adam is a chartered engineer and has helped develop specialist solutions in power generation applications throughout the UK, Ireland, the US and Africa. I'd also like to introduce David Mitchelltree, the Global Business Development and Sales Lead for INEO's Data Center Natural Gas and Hydrogen Generation Division. He brings more than 15 years of data center and industrial energy experience, uh, energy experience to INEO. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over the virtual reins to you, Adam. Thanks very much for that introduction uh, and, and good morning, good afternoon to you all, wherever you are in the world. I'm Adam Ray Summerson, Project and Market Development Manager for Clark Energy. And I'm going to try and walk you through some of the techno technological and policy discussions that help driving energy advancement within that data center kind of setting. Uh, firstly, a very brief introduction to Clark Energy, a global business that really does maintain a local family feel. Uh, we were established in the late 80s as a small service organization operating primarily in those days in the marine and offshore industries. And then in the early 90s, we were approached by Yenbacher GmbH, as they were known then, um, who wanted a strong service partner in the United Kingdom to help them penetrate the UK landfill gas market. That relationship has blossomed, and we now represent then in 27, or represent INEO as they are today, in 27 territories worldwide uh, with an installed base of some 7.2 gigawatts of gas engine technology. 
We've global experience of power generation solutions in both natural and non-natural gas type applications. So we understand local challenges, market drivers and inhibitors around the globe uh, with the considerable experience of a range of power generation solutions. And a growing percentage of that installed base um, whilst operating in some circumstances on natural gas provides what we call renewables enablement. That is providing power, critical power, to help balance intermittent renewables, i.e. when the sun isn't shining or the wind isn't blowing. And our methodology is to provide a flexible approach to our customers' demands, ranging from simple genset and power module supply through to turnkey delivery of engineering, procurement and construction, EPC style, uh, multi-engine and multi-technology energy centres that, that, that can kind of look at hybridising uh, a multitude of, of renewable and non-renewable technology. <clears throat> kind of looking at the, at, the, at the scene and setting the problem, so to speak, that David is, is going to help us solve later on, um, we've a complex energy system that comprises both centralised and decentralised plants uh, connected by a somewhat constrained transmission and distribution system. So increasingly more distributed energy solutions and intermittent renewables have been added to these systems, which in turn are contributing to reduce network stability. This adds to complexity of maintaining quality of power in terms of voltage and frequency on the network, uh, particularly at peak times, which then has a kind of a knock-on effect then to the security of supply and resilience capabilities within the data center context. And as we continue on the path to net zero, global electricity demands are also expected to continue to rise, perhaps by 40% as we approach 2050, according to the World Energy Outlook. Couple this global electricity demand with increase in both with increase in data demands and it becomes evident that our carbon reduction aspirations they do become increasingly challenging to try and achieve <clears throat> excuse me now future energy scenarios which is a publication by national grid in the uk looks to appraise how different approaches can help achieve those net zero emissions by 2050. There are four main scenarios considered in the 2020 version of the report, known as steady progression, step system transformation, consumer transformation, and leading the way. The takeaway from each of these really is that we should be able to achieve net zero by 2050 through society, societal change, behavioral change um, amongst con consumers, as well as net network infrastructure needing to be modernized, and critically, that a multitude of, of technologies are going to need to work together. Um, and an interesting point, I think, in, in most of the scenarios that Future Energy Scenarios looks at is that natural gas is still envisaged to play a part in UK generation as we approach 2050, albeit with carbon capture, utilisation and storage. And looking more recently at, at what's happened uh, with, with, with respect to power, obviously the CV19 um, global pandemic has had a stark and frankly horrifying impact on so many people's lives. Um, as different countries have endured varying levels of lockdown throughout 2020 and continuing into this year, uh, one thing that, that we've seen is that global energy demands did drop um, through curtailment of economic activity and curtailment of our own mobility. Primary energy demand, I think, reduced by around 6%. The consequence of which, as, as can see, be seen on the, on the right-hand side of this slide, is an almost 8% reduction in energy-related CO2 emissions compared to the previous year. The internet use uh, has, has surged in recent years, and I think compounded by us all moving to, or a majority of us moving to working from home and, and having to uh, maintain our streaming devices almost continuously to keep our children occupied when we're supposed to be homeschooling and working. Um, but according to the International Energy Agency, the number of internet users worldwide has doubled since 2010, and global internet traffic has grown by more than 10 times. We look at kind of forward forecasting towards 2022, and it, 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 internet traffic ex is expected to double again uh, to 4.2 zettabytes, which I believe are uh, 4.2 trillion gigabytes. Mobile internet users are projected to hit 5 billion by 2025, and Internet of Things connections are expected to double to 25 billion. The, the scale of, of, of this data demand is, is frankly mind boggling. That said, and, and despite these upward trends in, in consumption, globally overall energy demand 
um, within data centers has remained fairly consistent. Uh, and, and these days, I think data centers account for around 1% of global electricity demand. Uh, and, and this has remained the case primarily due to innovative infrastructure design, as well as hardware efficiency improvements within the data center. What we're also witnessing is a, is a shift away from smaller facilities to much larger hyperscale type data centers, as well as cloud-based facilities. Um, and, and, and I think that's continuing to have a play in, in an economy of scale, so to speak. Then within the data center and, 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 and what you guys are looking at as an industry in terms of your own sustainability goals, you know, you're pouring billions of dollars into sustainability and carbon reduction programs. And, this includes, in some circumstances, a move away from traditional diesel um, backup uh, plants, uh, as well as carbon offsetting, um, renewable electricity purchase, and a number of other me measures that are helping with that combined com approach, I suppose, to, to, to sustainability. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, if we look at kind of the traditional drivers for on-site generation, um, decentralized uh, generation in, in, in other terms, Utilizing or reciprocating internal combustion, it's a technical solution that has been utilized globally for a number of years, but largely driven by economics. That is offsetting relatively high electricity costs against relatively low gas costs in a number of territories worldwide. But this is also driven by, in the traditional sense, emissions reduction um, through high, high efficiency use of on-site generation. We're avoiding transmission and distribution losses through uh, existing um, network and we're maximize, maximizing usage of both heat and power generated locally uh, within, within an asset. Now, the emissions reduction element becomes less prevalent in, in territories that are deploying more renewables, such as, uh, as wind and, and solar at, at grid scale, because then the carbon intensity of, of those particular network systems reduces. But there is still a, a carbon saving play for a well-designed combined heat and power facility. But increasingly, resiliency on kind of the bottom left side of the triangle there has, has become a critical consideration, i.e. the ability to maintain operations in the event of a grid out outage or due to kind of continued network instability. The traditional data center energy supply model, um, you know, really reflects a, a very much a belts and braces style approach with multiple power sources, redundancy throughout every single layer of the system. And, and, and kind of critically stranded assets within within that uh, facility. And while these assets add to overall resiliency, um, they're, they're not contributing to sustainability goals, and nor are they helping the, the, the data center reduce energy supply costs. And it's an important kind of consideration as we look toward the future. I think as well, it's important for us to understand our, our, our actual energy usage and, and data centers are, are, are probably amongst the best type of consumers and customers of ours who do actually understand their, data, their, their energy use, um, as well as potential variances in, in cooling demands as opposed to heating demands, uh, as this could, could, could help us to kind of consider not just backup generation solutions, but also prime power solutions um, that help us to reduce energy costs and could well con contribute, as I've said earlier, to reducing carbon emissions. Excuse me. So, in terms of decarbonizing energy within that data center context, then um, you know we there are probably a multitude of, of, of complementary technologies that, that need to be considered, and each provides a varying level of, of emission reduction. So, it's a combination of these with and alongside increased penetration of renewable energy, which is is going to be the the answer or part of the answer, really. Uh, a little while ago, I, I heard an interesting quote uh, with respect to hydrogen, in so much as uh, and, and, it, and it read as hydrogen decarbonize, decarbonizes the parts direct electrification cannot reach. So essentially hydrogen, and it's very hot on, on certainly in, in, in European uh, policy discussions right now, um, uh, and, and globally really, you know, hydrogen is envisaged to be one of the, the keys to decarbonization of gas, to decarbonization of trans transportation, and, and, and holds potentially the key to a whole host of, uh, of opportunity. So it is an important element on that path to decarbonization, but its role probably in the next decade or so is going to be limited uh, before it 
blossoms as, as we get closer to the middle of the century. So hydrogen alongside an increased availability of biomethane, which in a number of territories still requires you know, heavy governmental support mechanisms, we, if we can continue to decarbonize our gas systems, then this is a, a critical cog in, in achieving net zero. There's other technologies on there of, of consideration. District energy and, and heat pump kind of could go hand in hand in, in the context of the data center in that you have waste heat available from your data hall, which could be scavenged um, to provide you know, a, 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 an increased temperature to amb ambient air through an air source heat pump, which in turn could, could be um, exported to a district heating scheme uh, and providing low carbon heat to, to, uh, to further consumers. <clears throat> we think about backup fuel, um, you know, historically the go-to solution in, within the data center has been and, and largely continues to be on-site diesel fuel storage uh, and diesel generators operating for, for backup, uh, to, to provide backup power. However, if we think about modern gas engine performance, the ability to deliver comparable load steps with lower emissions, then this, do we still need to have that um, storage medium on-site? Or is there an opportunity here to also move the storage, uh, the backup fuel storage off-site? What I mean by that is most current developed countries have a very substantial, significant, and readily available horizontal storage vessel running the length and breadth of a country. Um, it's fed from multiple ind indigenous production plants. Uh, there are often external liquefied natural gas uh, supply points and increasingly renewable gas um, injection points through biomethane right now and moving forward potentially through, through, through hydrogen. So the infrastructure to provide an always on backup solution is there. The map on the right hand side here shows the, 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 the main kind of gas infrastructure within, within Great Britain. And the two graphs on the left hand side, uh, misleading having them side by side, but, but, but nevertheless, uh, it, it uh, illustrates the point. Um, it, the, the, the two graphs demonstrate the total average outage of both the German electrical and gas systems. Uh, and in 2019, the electrical system, so the, the, uh, uh, if we think about the complete German electricity supply at transmission and distribution level, failed for approximately 12 minutes uh, throughout the entirety of 2019. Um, for the gas system, it failed for less than one minute over the course of the entire year. So evidently we have a very reliable and, um, and, and uh, dependable backup fuel solution that exists. So having gas supply to our data centers could be a, a viable storage solution. <clears throat> Excuse me. As and when hydrogen becomes more commercially available, there's certainly gonna be an opportunity, going to be an opportunity to utilize this to decarbonize the gas system alongside, as I've said, on multiple occasions, increase biomethane injection. The critical point really with hydrogen is where value lies. Um, and, and this will change as, as economics change and as electrolysis, electrolyzer performance continues to improve uh, and, and storage availability um, continues to expand um, in terms of on-site hydrogen storage and those types of applications, off-grid off type applications. But you know, if we think about renewable electricity being used as, as the electrical generator or the medium really to produce the energy carrier, i.e. the hydrogen, then the table here kind of illustrates that the, the amount of hydrogen required to provide a certain percentage by volume of fuel to a gas engine and how much power is needed from the renewables to produce each kilogram uh, of, of that or to produce the kilograms required for that given fuel. So for us to get one megawatt of electrical power using a 20% hydrogen blend into natural gas, we need to put um, 250 kilowatts worth of, worth of renewable power to produce five kilograms an hour of, of hydrogen. Uh, and, and that give, will give us a 20% blended fuel, which will result in a 7% reduction in CO2 emissions. And you can see there, as you increase the percentage of hydrogen, clearly we're, we're then going to increase the, 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 the amount of renewable electricity needed to generate that green hydrogen or, or, or excess renewable that, that could be available if otherwise curtailed. Uh, and, and you can see there, you know, if we get to a point where we have 100% hydrogen, um, then, then there would be 100% CO2 reduction in, in, in emissions from that gas engine. 
<coughs> Excuse me. Thinking about situations where we become increasingly dependent on um, renewable technologies, you know, what is happening when the wind isn't blowing or the sun isn't shining? Uh, and when we consider the very high levels of, of system non-synchronous penetration in certain markets, you know, the Irish market, for example, electrical market, for example, has, has achieved 70% SNSP um, at this point. This is influencing our electricity system, and it becomes clear that there is a risk, a real risk to network stability um, when, the, when the clouds blow over or the clouds appear and the wind stops blowing. So whilst battery in the data center sense is not new, um, you know, there's a, a widespread use of shorter duration, uninterruptible power supplies, UPS, um, has, has been used in, within the data center for, for, for a number of years, there is potentially an argument for longer duration systems that not only support the data center in terms of resiliency, but then can also be monetized and, and used to uh, deploy to provide grid balancing services such as DS3 in, in, in Ireland, frequency response and, and energy trading markets. So moving away from, from just focusing on internally within the data center, you know, we know we've got the resiliency of operation. We, can, we, we, we know we have the capability to supply up our demands. Why not utilize, rather than having these stranded assets, why not utilize them and monetize them um, in, in, in such a way that, that, that we can help reduce overall costs of running a data center? So the, the data center of tomorrow then um, is going to need to continue to deliver our increasing data demands and to do so whilst contributing to a lower carbon future. So as I've said, if we can monetize generation assets through basically generation of gas-fired uh, engines or backup, backup engines, um, provide grid balancing and stability service through energy storage, maximizing the use of, of, of renewables when they're available, then we can help kind of shape and frame the overall data center uh, economic case whilst maintaining the required levels of, um, of of efficiency, of availability, and of resiliency within that data center setting. So kind of in conclusion, really, you know, the high efficiency modern gas engine, um, it, it can and it should be part of, of your data center power supply strategy. The savings from, from a, a, a gas-fired system uh, can, can help enable renewables deployment, i.e. utilizing savings generated today to invest in, in, in future low carbon and, and zero carbon technologies. And also we're fu we have future-proofed assets that, that David's going to talk a little bit more about. So on that note, many, thank you, many thanks for your attention. And I hope you found this section kind of uh, uh, an interesting introduction into the problems that we believe uh, are facing data centers. And, and hopefully David can now talk a little bit more about how any of Yenbacher plan to provide the solutions to yourselves for those problems. Thank you. Hey, thanks a lot, Adam. Uh, my name is Dave Mitchell. I'm going to talk about energy and emission solutions for your data centers. Uh, we're leveraging a proven technology that's available today for this natural gas bridging to hydrogen technology. Uh, you know, it's a, a path of renewable, cleaner backup solutions for a data center where you can essentially monetize these assets, too, by arbitraging back into the electricity capacity demand response marketplace. So, uh, Ineo Yembacher, it was formerly GE Distributed Power, spun off as a group. Uh, now we have this rebranded name. So, next slide here. This is kind of the arc, you know, matching the theme of this uh, conference, the March Towards Net Zero We've heard about from Adam, like, you know, diesel generators, uh, hyperscalers are looking to phase those out by 2030. They're worried about the permitting, the emissions, uh, Title V with data center campuses. So an alternative to that is, is natural gas. Why natural gas? Well, let's talk about that. It's kind of encapsulated in this graph down below. And this is a, a three megawatt example uh, on-site engine. We're the only manufacturer of a, a three megawatt engine that kind of fits that data center architecture really nicely. Uh, if you have an out of the box diesel tier two versus a natural gas engine, that's about a 25% reduction of CO2. But hey, if you're gonna use green hydrogen, you're gonna be at zero carbon reduction, or zero carbon emissions with that platform. So that's the step, the leap going forward, the reason to consider a gas generator. Let's talk about NOx. 
Why would we want to talk about NOx? Because that's typically the limiting factor for emissions permitting at a data center campus. Uh, out of the box with a gas generator versus diesel, about a 90% reduction. If you're going to green hydrogen, you're less than 95%, you're over 95% reduction in NOx. You're never truly going to get rid of all the NOx uh, because you're, you know, obviously burning atmosphere, which is a high component mix of nitrogen and oxygen. But for both the natural gas and hydrogen, you can add on uh, SVR, selective catalytic reduction hardware, to reduce that even further. So we're pretty confident we can get the NOx down to almost nothing. So the theme here is, you know, if you want to buy a natural gas engine today, uh, we can convert it to hydrogen tomorrow, and we have dedicated 100% uh, hydrogen uh, engines on the market at this point in time. So let's talk about this in a little bit more detail and flip through some additional slides here. So a little bit of terminology uh, related to hydrogen. You've got the spectrum uh, of, of colors here, this rainbow. On the left, you've got renewable uh, green hydrogen. What does that mean? That means you're using renewable energy to uh, split water in an electrolyzer to produce hydrogen. That's kind of the nirvana that everyone's heading for with uh, the march towards net zero. At the other end of the spectrum, you've got fossil fuel, which is uh, basically, in most parts of the world, uh, based off of natural gas that's been broken down with steam methane reforming, and that is uh, about 95% of the supply globally. Back to the renewable green energy, that's about 1%. Uh, how's that stack up in terms of the cost structure then? Well, uh, obviously, uh, there's more of the fossil. That's going to be uh, two to three times um, cheaper than the renewable green energy in today's marketplace. As volume and other things change in these production, we've heard about large-scale projects uh, at scale. It's going to change over time. So when we look at kind of the spectrum of options here, uh, to get to the net zero carbon, the green renewable is, is the ultimate goal. Uh, fossil fuel is a supplier, but not necessarily carbon. It's not carbon neutral at all. Nuclear has got a red X. I'd argue that maybe that's a, a yellow dash there. Um, depending on who you're talking to, you know, there's different opinions on, on the carbon sustainability aspect and their corporate goals. So the supply right now is roughly 70 million tons a year globally that's being produced. Again, mainly it's the uh, gray hydrogen coming from natural gas. You expect to see a shift towards blue hydrogen and green hydrogen down the road with an explosion in the amount of uh, hydrogen that's available as these projects scale up. On the right-hand side, there's some ballpark comparison numbers, uh, what people think the pricing is and what it may be going forward, uh, just for uh, your consideration. But, you know, we're seeing, you know, pipelines blend in more of uh, hydrogen, and we want to be ahead of that curve with our engine technology. So, uh, again, why gas engines for data centers? Well, it's a path towards net zero. Right now, we got into the game uh, for data center backup generation with the fast start three megawatt units, uh, or it can be three megawatts, uh, one and a half megawatts. Uh, we talked about the emissions, but basically the, the ability to take on a block load of electricity and have a fast transient response. You got high quality power going into the data center. That was the big kind of technological leap uh, going from a tried and true long duration running platform engine to something that's a fast start. So that was our uh, track record with a uh, hyperscale data center installed and using these type of engines already. Um, dual fuel is kind of the next iteration. We've had dual fuel uh, engines out there. When I say dual fuel, that's hydrogen and natural gas blended up to 60%. Um, we've got uh, a test bed I'll talk about in a little bit of one megawatt that went from 100% methane to 100% hydrogen. Uh, that's our uh, successful test um, last year. And then uh, we have dedicated 100% hydrogen engines available today. That's available now. So if you cut me a PO today, I'll have one, an engine to you by fourth quarter of this year uh, installed and operational. So you bring the supply, we'll bring the solution. Uh, you bring the supply of hydrogen. So uh, that's, you know, 
zero CO2 emissions, uh, significant NOx reduction with that platform. Uh, we talked a little bit, you know, about the uh, fast start. That's 45 seconds to full load and then high quality power. Uh, the reliability, natural gas grid is below ground. Uh, that infrastructure is pretty resilient. Built-in storage, you know, negates the risks of refueling and runtime limitations. And then, you know, we've got correlated failure. The gas and electric grids is very low. Um, Adam was showing a European example. I mean, aside from ERCOT in the U.S., which has some extenuating circumstances and is a unique uh, regulatory environment in that they've gone a different direction from FERC and uh, don't have winterization requirements, and that kind of bit them uh, in this 30- to 50-year periodic event that reared its head recently. The rest of the grid structure in North America, uh, the correlated failure, very low probability. Um, energy insurance policy that can be monetized, uh, you can parallel back to the grid, uh, island away. You've got the dispatchable, uh, you know, behind-the-meter solution that you can leverage if you want to arbitrage into the energy capacity demand response marketplaces. Proven technology, uh, you know, 53,000 engines, 54 gigabytes installed globally. Uh, I got a map of that kind of at the end. But um, significant number of engines out there uh, that are running around the world with a variety of gas applications. Data centers just being one, one segment of that application at this point in time. So here's kind of a, a different slice of uh, the representation of these different engines and where we're at for the gas blend. So on the left-hand side, you can see uh, the natural gas pipeline supply, uh, up to 25% blending uh, anticipated or, or occurring in different parts of the world, industrial applications. Uh, we have engines that you can buy today, up to 10 megawatts available to address that. The intermediate step is kind of the uh, blending uh, dual fuel of hydrogen natural gas uh, with the flex conversion. Again, kind of you buy an engine today, convert it to hydrogen later, uh, up to one megawatt available currently, uh, two megawatts next year. Uh, and then there's that leap. The new technology moving forward is 100% uh, dedicated hydrogen engine. Uh, what's the difference in going from the flexible to the dedicated engine, well, you've got, you know, a port injection with a flexible fuel, a dedicated engine like you see it with the on-road automotive applications. It's a direct injection. That would be the technological shift there. Um, and, you know, the ignition temperature of hydrogen is a little bit different than, than uh, natural gas. So you want to accommodate that with some of the hardware on the engine. Uh, we've got the one megawatt available there. We've got the tech specs. We can send those to you. We can talk through the details, pricing, everything on that as of today. Three megawatt is the future state. We'd love to have a strategic data center par partner to kind of move that forward from our end uh, to get that accomplished sooner as opposed to later. Let's talk about kind of conceptual, this network. Uh, you've probably heard variants of this from some of the other speakers in the panels, the DCD this, uh, today and yesterday. Uh, effectively, you got on the left-hand side, your renewable generation, wind, solar. If it's curtailed or undervalued, negative pricing, why not run that through an electrolysis, electrolysis process? Uh, you could even utilize biogas where it makes sense, where it's cost-effective. The storage component is a really, uh, uh, you know, interesting um, thing these days because you could have hydrogen, you could have uh, ammonia. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about ammonia. Because it has synthetic fuels, methanol, um, and all this is your portable, storable, green, renewable energy that you can run through your generators to power your data center arbitrage back into the net. Hey, in a place like uh, Ireland that Adam was talking about, transportation could be a great anchor tenant to this mix of this hydrogen economy, right? Uh, where you've got, um, in Ireland, a, a high concentration of data centers, data center growth. Uh, you'd have transportation as your anchor base load day-to-day -day utilization of hydrogen. Uh, preferably have a pipeline connection to that hydrogen supply to back up your data center when you need it so you can avoid a lot of storage on site. But, you know, Ireland's got a lot of wind and natural gas with the installed base going forward. So it'd be an interesting story in some place like that. Where it makes sense, I think it's going to be fairly interesting to try and tackle these energy and emission uh, solutions problems. So here's our uh, cutting-edge success story uh, commission 
uh, generator in Germany, uh, fourth quarter last year, with the customer collaboration there. Uh, they're anticipating, you know, the uh, blending of hydrogen to the natural gas grid infrastructure. They want to be ahead of the curve on that. It gave us an opportunity to go through and test the energy uh, efficiencies of the engine and the fuels, uh, variable fuel ratios from 100% uh, natural gas up to 100% hydrogen, and the conversion of the hardware and software to accommodate all of this. The uh, yellow pipe in this picture is our hydrogen supply coming in, and you can see our uh, real guy doing real work there, our highly paid model there, uh, playing around with the port injection on that engine. Um, so uh, a success story, customer's happy, it's up and running. Here's another view of this. This is a, a Yenbacher J416 platform. So there it is in all of its glory up and running in uh, Hamburg, Germany. Let's talk about fuel supply. Some of the big questions that always come up are, you know, hey, what's the fuel supply? I'm laying out my data center campus. What's this going to look like? What do I need to consider? Um, and then safety is another issue. So let's talk a little bit about that in, in general. So if you look in the center, there's a graph in terms of, you know, volumetric energy density of fuels. Uh, and at the top, you see the gray bars are all the carbon-based fuels. Diesel obviously has the highest energy intensity coming down the list of ethanol, uh, uh, LNG, methanol. And then you get to zero carbon fuels, and you see um, liquid ammonia, highest energy density, then followed by hydrogen, and then lithium-ion batteries. So what's this look like if you're trying to do a little bit of storage on site and you can't pipeline connect into a hub? Um, and this is a little bit of an apples and oranges. We've got uh, hydrogen supply on a cryogenic basis, but it's uh, on-road or rail transport uh, capabilities, and that has about you know 83 hours of runtime to fuel a one megawatt engine. On the other side, we've got uh, ammonia supply here, uh, 18,000 gallon uh, tank there, bullet tank. And that's about 96 hours of runtime. So storable, uh, it's, it's doable. Um, there's pros and cons, but, you know, this is some of the consideration and dialogue. And from a safety standpoint, you know, ammonia has some really uh, well-established uh, handling and safety protocols. And you can crack uh, the ammonia for your hydrogen supply. So you can have your portable, storable, uh, renewable energy supply in the form of ammonia, crack that and utilize that in your engines uh, to power your data center in an emergency basis or backup basis. So uh, when we're talking about the different, you know, spectrum of technologies that has been, you know, brought up in, in these different forms in DCD this week here, uh, we want to kind of encapsulate that and put the, you know, gas generators in, in context here. So on the left, in the stoplight uh, diagram, qualitative look, you've got your diesel generators. Uh, again, the emissions is a problem there. Uh, natural gas generation at one and a half to three megawatts that we're providing to data centers that are installed and running right now. And then, you know, dual fuel generation. Again, get a gas generator today, convert it to hydrogen tomorrow. Next phase, you know, these hydrogen dedicated engines that we have available, the hydrogen generator there. And then uh, fuel cells, you know, uh, maybe a future state. I know some of the other uh, panelists are, are, are experimenting with this. It's a future state. We have a solution that's available today off the shelf, ready to roll for you. And um, like I said, we've got the tech specs and can provide those to you uh, currently. So we're the gas engine experts uh, designed a dedicated gas engines, global distribution, uh, 100 countries, 53,000 engines, 54 gigawatts of installed capacity. We'd love to talk to you more. We're an OEM manufacturer of engines in uh, Europe and North America. So um, reach out to me if you want to talk about gas engines, you know, data center energy solutions, emission solutions. You can leverage my experience in the utility world with natural gas, electric, interconnection considerations, tariff structures. But primarily I want to say thank you for your time and uh, listening in today and stick around for our roundtable afterwards. Thanks a lot. Perfect. Thank you so much, gentlemen. If uh, if we were live, we'd be getting a massive uh, round of applause in person. Um, so, yeah, thank you for that. So we did keep an eye on Q&A that came in through uh, the audience. 
Um, Adam, I want to pose uh, the first question to you. So we spoke a lot about hydrogen being one of the keys to uh, decarbonising data centres, uh, as well as biomethane, which I've heard a lot less about. Uh, when do we believe that hydrogen will actually become commercially viable as, as a fuel alternative to diesel? Um, I mean, it's a very good question. There's a lot of conflicting sources out there around the world as to when hydrogen becomes commercially or commercially available. You know, the, the technology is there right now. Um, we have a multitude of very good electrolysis companies delivering technology or delivering solutions right now that is producing hydrogen. Comparative to gas, it, to, to natural gas, it is expensive, but it is clearly you know a, a, a zero carbon alternative if if the electricity driving that electrolyzer is is supplied by the green electricity, renewable electricity rather. So the the, the timescales are, are, are up for debate and and will broadly be determined by policymakers probably in the next two to three years. I think that's when we're going to see. Real certainly across Europe, and David may may have a different idea for North America, um, but but that's when we're really going to see a, a drive uh, or a move away from theoretical policy to more how we deliver. Um, you know, if 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 we look at uh, future energy scenarios and and some of the some of the uh, scenarios that they've considered, it looks like the majority of UK supplied natural gas is still methane as it is today, well into the late 2030s. Um, I, I can't answer any better than that. I'm afraid it, it, it's very much a crystal ball kind of thing. No, that's absolutely fine. Uh, so David, do you have anything you want to add there, maybe from a more of a US perspective? Yeah, I mean, there's some big projects in the books that are planned. Uh, you see, like, the L.A. Department of uh, Power and Water has a massive project proposed with uh, significant hydrogen storage and supply in Utah with a salt dome. Uh, it'll be interesting. The RFPs went out third quarter last year. It'd be great to hear kind of where they're at in that process. I have no idea about the economics, but a uh, fairly aggressive timeline on that. There's some other projects in uh, Florida, Ohio, uh, that – these economy of scale projects will push things forward. And certainly you're seeing that reflected in the amount of interest in the hydrogen space currently. So uh, I'm not going to speculate on a timeline. It's outside of my scope, but uh, I think uh, things are happening fairly quickly. We heard that from some other panelists earlier, uh, billions of dollars being invested to move things forward. So it's a, it's a really interesting time and transition. And, and, you know, hopefully we have a solution that fits in to that for data centers with these gas engines, you know, convertible to hydrogen as that as that wave comes our direction with a big spike in hydrogen. I'll stop there. Thanks. <laughs> no problem. Thank you for that. David, I'm coming back to you. So you spoke sure. a lot about the benefits of, of gas generators, the fast start, the reliability, you know, the, the pipeline, the fuel su uh, supply is growing every year. How do you think they would have fared uh, in Texas? Snowstorm compared to traditional diesel gen sets. Do you think they're climate crisis ready? Uh, yeah, I mean, ERCOT is a little bit of a unique uh, situation, but I can talk to a success story in the Austin, Texas area where we have a customer running gas gens, um, 50 megawatts equivalent. Uh, they provided power throughout the crisis. Even with, you know, natural gas costs spiking at about $400 per MMBTU. But, you know, you're, you're arbitraging into a market where there's a market cap of $9,000 per megawatt. So, you know, uh, it was a resource that was originally built for, um, you know, balance, d built and designed and located to balancing wind resource generation. In this case, they are arbitraging back in the market, supporting the grid um, throughout this uh, energy cold crisis in the ERCOT region. Um, a lot of it for the ERCOT area is because, you know, ERCOT in Texas has kind of gone uh, this route to avoid uh, FERC regulation, the Federal Energy Regulatory Regulation. Um, they don't require their power plants to be winterized. 
so uh you know this 30 or 50 year event that happened recently um they had infrastructure freeze and that was a cascading event i mean all generations uh generation resources underperformed expe expectations over this uh significant cold snap i mean obviously it's a tragic event with um people uh fatalities and other things like that uh, but the reality is the regulatory structure is kind of what, you know, pushed this forward in a lot of ways. Um, so a success story in that we've had gas engines run uh, in that recent cold snap effectively. Arbitraging back to the market provides grid support successfully throughout the whole incident. Um, the reality is, is that, yeah, there was a, a big underperformance with all the uh, generation resources, particularly natural gas because of frozen infrastructure. But, you know, parts of ERCOT that were outside, parts of Texas that are outside of ERCOT fared fine because, um, you know, they, they, they follow the FERC regulations for winterization. So uh, it's a bit of a mixed bag. It'll be an interesting um, event to see how that changes going forward. Uh, you've seen m many of the regulators resign this past week. So I think there's probably going to be some changes for dramatic events. It has certainly spurred more interest for people wanting to have dispatchable behind the meter uh, generation that you know they can uh, control in outages uh, be it cold events or flooding or fires in different parts of the country and world so hopefully that's a little bit of an insight yeah no that's really helpful it's good to uh, to use a you know a topical event uh, to connect to, to what we do and what we're speaking about um, yep. so a question from uh, a gentleman who belongs to a colo whose name rhymes with syllable. Perhaps we can take a wild, <laughs> a wild guess at who that might be. Um, he's asking how the footprint of a three megawatt natural gas system compares to an equivalent three megawatt diesel system. Any thoughts there? Oh yeah, it's uh, almost the same. It's a little bit longer, uh, but same footprint in terms of a containerized solution. So. Uh, the three megawatt fast start units that have been installed, I mean, they're, they're two modules, they're stackable, uh, just slightly longer than a, a three megawatt diesel, but uh, effectively same modular solution. So no great footprint disruption at all. I think possibly the other point to add there, David, is that f from an overall footprint of, of, of non data activity within the data center context is if we're utilizing a gas engine that, that is supplied by pipeline gas, you've no on-site storage either. So so you're freeing up more yeah. space potentially for another data hole in that respect. Yep, exactly. <laughs> and you're avoiding the expense of uh, belly tanks and some of that other stuff and, you know, the risk factor of refueling or having a, you know, a, a ne neglected belly tank turn out like your kid's neglected aquarium with a bunch of stuff. <laughs> Uh, going sideways on you because yeah, diesel has a shelf life. Perfect. Thank you. So many questions. Uh, another one. So monetization is something you spoke about also, David. Um, can you get into a bit sort of a bit more depth on how that works in practice? So the monetizing of the asset uh, of the gas generator asset. Yeah, sure. I mean, you can look at different markets within North America. You have the ISOs. Uh, someplace like PJM, uh, you have the ability to arbitrage into the capacity uh, or the energy market. Uh, ERCOT, uh, Texas, like we're talking about, is an energy-only market. I gave an example of one of our customers using gas engines to provide electricity into uh, a, a peak um, pricing scenario. Um, you've got you know, with diesel generators under the U.S. EPA regulations, you cannot run them for economic dispatch. There's a little bit of DER you can do in, in ERCOT, but that's the only kind of exception. With natural gas, you're not limited. You can use these resources uh, to arbitrage back into the energy capacity, demand response marketplaces. Um, you know, depending on the location in the grid uh, and the different incentives or market uh, constraints or uh, opportunities within the retail or wholesale marketplace, there's a variety of different options. Um, be happy to talk about that in more detail. I've got a big slide deck on that, and uh, we've you know, engaged with some outside partners that are very active in the arbitrage space. So if you want to reduce the optics of your data center, 
uh, you've got greater opportunity with uh, gas engines than you do with diesel by far because regular because you cannot do uh, economic dispatch with diesel gens. You can do that with natural gas uh, with the lower emissions, um, you know, favorable economics with very inexpensive natural gas. Hydrogen's another story, but anyway, uh, there's opportunities there, and it's very. I'd say location dependent, um, but where it makes sense, love to talk to you some more about that. And you have my contact information to do some follow up. But it can be uh, for a cola provider a real advantage. If you can reduce your OPEX expenses, uh, you're at an advantage compared to the cola provider across the street in Ashburn, Virginia, who uh, can't pass those savings on to their uh, potential tenant. And um, you know, uh, there's a lot, there's a lot of interest from that perspective. Thank you. Perfect. No, that's absolutely fine. We could uh, we could honestly go all day on this. Uh, there's been so many questions, but I would like to encourage everyone to join the roundtable. Um, before we do that, uh, I'd like to give a, a massive uh, you know round of applause and thank you to uh, Adam and David for that brilliant presentation. Uh, when presentations have as many questions as you've garnered, they've obviously um, stimulated a lot of debate. So thank you for sharing your insights with us. For those of you watching, please take this opportunity to rate the session now on your screen. It's always uh, awesome for us to get your feedback. Let us know whether you want to hear more from these gentlemen. And next up, uh, we have a technology showcase of best in breed sustainable energy solutions from Dyson Vertiv, which is taking place in about 10 minutes, less than 10 minutes. Uh, so please feel free to join that. If you prefer to continue the, the conversation on everything hydrogen and gas generation, please join David, uh, Adam and I on the virtual roundtable where we'll discuss what impact the hydrogen economy will have on the evolution of the data center sector. Now, we'll be kicking off that roundtable right now. There's a link on your screen, so please do click through to join that. Uh, we're about to kick off. So thanks again, and we'll see you shortly. Thank you.